Hello and welcome to this episode of the Curiosity Key podcast where I'm joined with Jonathan Thirkhill. Hi Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Hi Charlie, thanks for having me. Brilliant, well to kick things off, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, what you're up to at the moment? Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, my name is Jonathan Thirkhill and I'm the founder and chief exec of Boostify and we're a customer experience optimization um, business. So basically we work with different brands on uh, on-site personalization, so figuring out the right message to deliver to the right person at the right time, so it boosts their engagement online, basically. Fantastic. Now, the reason why I wanted to have you on this podcast is because I think we believe in very, very similar things, which is all around personalization and also segmentation and not spamming people with the exact yeah. same message because you know we have enough of that today and the internet is just such a noisy noisy place uh and especially you know if you want to get your message out to the right people you do need to be a bit more specific and you do need to add an element of personalization into that so definitely keen to to talk some more about that but this platform you've developed it yourself and and started it out so i just want to explore a little bit with you you know how did you come up with the idea and then how did you turn that idea into reality yeah totally so so um it's a bit of kind of a, a stepping stone actually so it started um as live chat specifically so that's kind of the, the where it first started and it's moved a long way from there now we've kind of pivoted as we've as we've gone along um but originally, um, I was working for a company called Age Partnership. Um, I was basically managing their web development team. And they were coming to me um, kind of daily saying, we want to do this, we want to do that, we want to personalize. Oh, what happens if someone likes a website here? And originally, they wanted to engage with people using a, a human. So we talked about putting a live chat in place so that we could actually, you know, if someone's on this page and they've been on there a few minutes, let's let's speak to them. You know, we, we don't have to tell them and we'll, we'll send a message. Um, so I originally built the platform specifically to, for their problem. Um, and what happened over time is they wanted kind of uh, exit intent overlays and they wanted to personalize more pages with more content. And it kind of, we went down this rabbit hole where nothing quite worked. They didn't have a system that could use it. They didn't have an inbuilt CMS. They looked at conversion optimization platforms, but back then um, they were a bit clunky or expensive and didn't quite work. Um, so I basically started manually with my development team building these complex behavioral segmentation um, kind of on the site. And kind of, I don't know, a year in, I thought, well, there must be a better way of doing this. Um, and it occurred to me that the functionality of the live chat, and we'd built this system where we could target people. If we just expanded that out into other types of messaging, other types of content, that we could have something that would work really, really well. Um, so instead of having to manually build these rules to serve content, we could go into the existing interface and just start delivering messages. Um, and ultimately, uh, building that um, worked really well for them. Um, and at that point, clearly, it was always my intention to sell it to other people. That was always the plan. But they were a perfect guinea pig. Um, we then kind of went out to the to the market with it, um, and that was kind of early 2019. We kind of went public with with the platform. But that was kind of the journey. Um, it was more of a hobby at the beginning. It was more of kind of moonlighting as such. I was just kind of working on it. I didn't really know where it would, where it would go. Um, being live chat at the beginning was um, kind of shoehorning into a very populated marketplace so like it occurred to me i can't just go to market with a live chat platform because there's hundreds of those and you know and it's just me developing it i clearly can't keep it with these big corporations like live person who are on the stock market it's like we don't have anything here um, but as i try started to expand it out into this other messaging it occurred to me that there wasn't anything that quite worked in the same way other platforms worked on um the actual website um so you'd actually inter integrate them and have developers whereas boostify uses an intelligence layer to essentially allow it to go on any site without having to change any code and deliver custom messaging and that's really kind of the ethos of the current platform and, what, and where we help brands at the moment fantastic so Hopefully just to sense. to understand so when you say you developed it did you write the code and and do that all yourself or did you work with the team um, so originally, uh, resource-wise, um, there was just myself. Um, but as it expanded and we started uh, getting revenue from kind of uh, our closed client base, so trying with different brands, um, I used that money to reinvest in the development team. Um, it was never that large, um, so progress was probably slower than it could have been if we had investment. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that as, as well. I never wanted to get investment. Um, 
which is a whole other story. But um, I, I really wanted to kind of build it grassroots, own development team, retain, retain control of the business, execute my vision, not someone else's vision. Um, so to do that was probably a little bit slower, but we had a small development team and we still do today of uh, three or four developers who kind of expanded it into what it is today. Brilliant. So how did you convince your employer to let you sort of like essentially be your guinea pig for this new business <laughs> idea that you had? Um, I, d- I don't know. what I, I, I do actually vaguely remember. So they were using an agency um, down in London. Um, and this is where the live chat stuff happened. We went to an agency. I was down in London as kind of the lead developer, as running the web development team. Um, and the agency did an audit on on Age Partners' website, and they said, you know, "Here's we've looked at competitors, and here's things that you don't have." One of the things was live chat. Um, now, uh, the other people in the business weren't that bothered about it, but I actually truly believed that that would be the right thing for the business. Um, and essentially, I kind of went into the directors and said, "Right, we're not doing live chat. We've been told by your agency we should be doing it." I'll put it in, I'll develop it, and I won't charge you anything. And that sounded a bit crazy. Um, but I just said, look, it's free. Um, and then once I've got something that works and it delivers return on, well, would deliver return on investment, I'll start charging for it. And they were comfortable with that. Um, and yeah, that, that worked for me. Uh, because I wasn't really bothered at the time. I was like, I, d- I wasn't, I was living at home. Like, I didn't have much expenses. So I was like, I'll just work on my night and I'll just make it, I'll just build it. I'll just, you know spend lots of sleepless nights on out which is essentially what I did and then slowly not gonna, you know maybe a bad thing but um it would merge the time between what I was doing there and what I was doing on the live chat started to merge so mm-hmm. they would ask me during work hours for support on the live chat platform um and ultimately I started kind of working on it and being paid because I was doing it in 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 their time as such but because it was benefiting their business they didn't care yeah and what sort of results did you did you see from working on it yourself and sort of being at the being at the coal face essentially? Yeah, it was it was in terms of like commercial results. Um, they saw um, uh, I can't remember how much volume we were getting through because it was quite a while ago now. But um, I think we saw on certain pages up to forty percent more engagement um, by delivering these targeted messages, and that was really like huge for them, huge for me. Um, it was nice to actually be making a difference because you don't really know when you start out. You're like, I'm going to do this. And this is very true with Boostify as well. You, you talk about these messaging and, and it does take a while to figure out what the right messaging is for people. Um, and there's an air of kind of, will it work for the brand? Will live chat fundamentally work for this brand? Or am I going down completely the wrong rabbit hole here? Um, yeah. So once it started to work, there was, there was a massive side relief of like, oh my God, all this development work isn't, hasn't gone yeah. to, to waste because it was always like if it hadn't worked they would have said oh thanks for building it but it's not really right for our business yeah and then I lost my only revenue source uh, and kind of that that it would just be hard for the business so um, yeah. luckily it, it worked for them brilliant and so what was your tipping point uh really from going from employment I'm guessing full am I right in thinking full-time employment yeah, it was full time then. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was your tipping point from going from full time employment to then thinking, right? Okay, this is a proven business idea. Uh, yeah. I'm going to do this full time. Yeah. Um. So it was kind of staggered actually. Um. So they were very reliant on me. It was quite a small development team. Um. So if I just handed my notes in, they would have um been quite angry. Um. But there was a point when um I remember going into a room with my mon- uh, my boss at the time and saying. And kind of probably more frustration rather than anything of saying, look, I'm sat here working with you. The other, I think I was down to kind of three days for them, two days for Boost Design. And I was like, I'm not getting enough done in the two days. I've got this vision. I, you know, at this point, the development team is quite small. I can't execute properly. Um, I need more time. I, I, you know, it was kind of more frustration. I was like, I could make this huge, but instead I'm working on your emails or whatever. Um, and it was kind of this frustrating period in my life. And I look back at it and been like, that was frustrating um and i basically um just slowly staggered my days down slowly gave more and more away they put someone else in um to run the team until i was kind of one day a week and in fact still to this day i still occasionally consult at the business because they um still appreciate the um expertise i bring um as well as the fact that they're still using boostify so it's good to have me around 
brilliant I love it and how uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, your point earlier about not wanting investment so tell, tell us a little bit about that like yeah so um, I've always been told um, by uh, my, my father uh, who also runs businesses to um, always be in control and uh, he's had businesses where he's given control away and it's kind of frustrating um, and I've always had it drilled into me that having potentially a VC or investment is a bit of a nightmare. Now, I'm, I'm, I've never actually done it, so I might be completely wrong. But I also quite like the idea of taking something from nothing, not taking investment, and actually iterating the product, getting revenue in, reinvesting it, and growing a business that way. Like, that just feels, I don't know, it, it's a lot harder. Um, and I would, you know, if people want to do it, it takes a lot, a lot more effort and a lot more time. Like, it, you, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Like, you, you, you have to invest slowly. It takes time to reinvest in marketing. And that, that um, I think the challenge as well is how much do you invest in R&D on the product, especially in technology. And that's one thing that I found particularly tough with booster buyers. By doing it ourselves um, and not having a load of cash to pump into development, it does slow you down. It, it has to. You, you can't put the scale in that other companies have. And what that means is, essentially, as technology moves on, it becomes harder to keep up. Um, now, we get around that um, by focusing really specifically on things on the platform that deliver ROI to our clients. So we make sure everything that we release is specific to that goal. So we don't worry about the fluffy stuff. And really focus on the marketing as well. Um, and making sure that we're talking about the right stuff. Um, we did a survey recently um, through YouGov looking at data around um, what consumers feel like personalization and, and that kind of angle, just being a bit smarter around it, looking at PR, um, things that are a little bit less costly, um, but kind of can, can work in, in just as, as an effective way. So that that's a really interesting point because I know a huge number of companies that are very R and D driven. So there's there's always that big argument like do we do we reinvest the money into more R and D or do we invest the money into marketing to get it in front of more people? Based on your own experience, what advice would you give to somebody else that's kind of going through that uh, challenge? If you like, I think I think it depends on the industry. Um, so in technology, um, especially something that's comparable so if you look at the live chat analogy it's very easy to look at that and compare it apples to apples with other businesses but if you've got more of a unique proposition boostify is is what we feel that is um because of the way we deliver the messaging nobody else is doing it quite the same way it means that when someone comes to to to, to into the buying cycle and looking to purchase it the comparisons are different um and therefore it's 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 it is a more of a unique product and therefore, they can't just say, well, you don't have X, Y, and Z. It's not like a car. That one goes faster. That one not six is faster, and you're trying to charge more. It, you move out, out of that realm. If you've got a business that, that is less comparable to something else, then 100% marketing, I would say. Focus on driving traffic to your website, <clears throat> having conversations, events, just speaking to people, getting out there as much as possible, as many conversations as possible. Um, because if you've got something that can truly change their business, um, then you need to be telling people about it. Um, because I don't, you know, people say, if you, if you build it, they'll come. Um, I think in, in the current marketplace online, that isn't true anymore. If you build it, they won't come. You need to, <laughs> you need to drive the traffic. You need to be thinking about how you can create something different, um, you know, whether or not that's hashtags or whatever it might be, just something to, to kind of drum up some brand awareness. That, yeah. um, so I would definitely advise people to focus on that. Um, you obviously need a good product, so um, there is a point, but but don't spend, people talk about um, uh, MVPs, so minimum viable products, I totally agree on that. If you've got an idea, build something that works and go out and tell, tell people about it, shout about it, see what they say, and then you can iterate based on their feedback, and that's really yeah. important. Um, yeah. no, it's really, really good advice. And just to summarize the great advice is that you do need to put yourself out there. You do need to tell people about what it is that you're doing and focus on having those conversations and also those commercial conversations because you can't expect people to just stumble on your product or your service and you can't expect people to just come to you because you have something that they need. Uh, you do need to go and tell them about it. Uh, and, you know, those focus on, on marketing is is really, really important. Uh, so just out of, out of curiosity and also 
also to help other people. What forms of marketing have worked best for you in terms of uh, promoting, especially in the early days, in terms of getting your MVP out there? What were your most successful forms of marketing? Um, PR has worked really well yeah. um, for us. And so just looking at uh, telling our story, talking about, um, I think it's really relevant at the moment. A lot of brands are having issues with conversion rates, you know, as and just being relevant online. Um, the swipe left, swipe right culture of Tinder and kind of TikTok this year and all, all the new apps that people's attention spans are, are, are falling. Um, there's no two ways about it. Um, and, and I think that it's having an, a knock on impact in, in, into brands. So they're advertising online and, and you really have to be sharp these days. Um, so, so yeah, so I think um, PR is really important um, uh, to drive um, the right conversations on that. Brilliant. So in terms of PR, so my experience with PR, I, I love it. It does work. It's really good, but it's really difficult to track the ROI of PR. So how yeah. do you know that the PR is working? How do you track that? Put me um, on the spot here. <laughs> for us, it's been a little bit more hands to mouth. Um, so, um, we've, a lot of our sales, uh, comes, we don't really have much where it's online. It's, it's really because the product's quite complex in terms of implementing it. Um, you know, you, you can't just sign up and put the tag on your site and, and you're good to go. Um, we have to, um, go out and speak to people. Um, so, um, when we speak to people, we say, where did, where did you hear from us? Um, and we've had a lot of our bigger clients say, we saw you in so-and-so magazine um saw you online here and um, so that's the way we've tracked it so nothing um very advanced um for a tech business but that's kind of worked for us yeah brilliant and you, you mentioned events and trade shows earlier as well like how much time and money i guess have you invested in events and trade shows and how have they worked for you yeah so we did um we've done uh we actually only done one so far we did the e-commerce show north um, which was uh in manchester um, and it worked really well. We had uh, a lot of meaningful conversations. Um, it, I would say in, in those, um, for us anyway, it was um, quite difficult in terms of comparison. So because we're a smaller startup, our stand was a little bit smaller than some other people's and our positioning wasn't quite as good. And, you know, if we had big pockets of money, um, we could have probably had something, you know, for people to sit down on chairs and given out. Um, so we kind of had to be a bit more creative. So we gave our battery packs to people that said boost to fire them so they could um, charge their phones on the go. Um, and we had like a TV screen. So we kind of did it on a budget. But for us, it worked really well. We had loads of conversations um, and we had a couple of um, new clients off the back of it. Um, but again, I think if you do, for, for technology specifically, I think, it, you know, you are, you've got to make an impression digitally and physically. And for us, investing in a, a good enough stand to compete is really important mm -hmm. especially kind of people that are security conscious if you look too small it can kind of uh, be counterproductive so my only advice on that would be they are really good but make sure you've got your standing order invest in that and um, we kind of went down the middle middle of the road so we weren't the biggest stand we weren't the smallest stand but we kind of and that and that's i think worked for us but my advice would be um for events just make sure you're prepared um, yeah. and kind of think outside the box well, i think we we're the only ones giving out batch of that and that worked really well you know, everybody's phones ring our battery. Everybody's at an event. And yeah. We pre-charged them. We spent hours the night before. Everybody charging all the battery packs like it's ridiculous. Like, and then and then giving them out, going, "Oh, it's charged. Here's your battery phone." But that was that worked really, really well, and people remembered it. So, um, I think events are really good. Just be creative. And yeah. Don't just put a stand up. That's uh, that's brilliant advice, and it's really, really great to hear because a lot of companies will just they'll do a lot of events, they'll funnel a lot of money into events, but just go very unprepared. And it is more about just having the uh, you know the stand and and people there. It is about being creative, and it is about making sure that you know how to get people into that, and also give them something that's very relevant. So the fact that you got the battery packs, you understand that people you know everybody has a phone, they have a need, uh, and that you can stand out and. Also also, it's something that's branded. So, you know, you are remembered. Uh, and also that you took that care and attention to think, right, people's batteries run out when they're there. I'm going to pre-charge those. And that yeah. extra effort in time will, you know, pay off you know, tenfold yeah. because people will remember you. And they've also got something that they can take away 
uh, afterwards. There's because uh, I, I noticed that you've got a drone at the back uh, of your <laughs> office as well. I, I used to sell okay. high end drones, and one of my earlier clients there uh, was a drone insurance company, and they had um, they went to events and they had like a thermos flask, but it was a decent thermos flask, and it had uh, their logo and their branding and everything on it. And it was so. I mean, I've still got one. I take it out <laughs> when I'm walking in the hills all the time, and it's great because their target market was drone operators. Drone operators, you know, you fly them outside. If you're doing it commercially, you'll be there, there in the winter. So if you've got a thermos yeah. full of tea, it just makes your experience a lot more enjoyable. So you'll remember yeah. it. So makes yeah, it is, um, it's really, really good. Um, so thank you for that. It's always nice to hear people have good experiences with events and uh, yes. and talk about the, the benefit of putting in that extra effort. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about uh, data insights and personalization mm-hmm. for a moment, because yep. that's one of your USPs. That's what you focus on. And, you know, just uh, for the benefit of all of our listeners, very much B2B audience. Why is, I mean, I know, <laughs> you know, but for the benefit of everybody else, why is data insights and personalization so important, especially uh, in today's marketplace? Yeah. So as I touched on um, this kind of swipe left, swipe right culture, um, attention spans are dropping. Um, you have to be more relevant these days. You can't, gone are the days of, I'm going to test a red button versus a green button for my entire audience and see which one works better. If you want to compete commercially now um, and you want to drive traffic through paid channels, you you have to be doing more than just having a standard landing page. Um, so being relevant and learning what that customer does, uh, learning as much about them, so their data, you know, what what are they, what signals are they showing what browser they're coming from where are they and using that information dynamically and live to personalize that journey is a must you you really have to be doing it um because otherwise your bounce your bounce rate will just be too high you won't be able to make it make it work um from an ri point of view you're spending money on google ads you know it it can get can be expensive and traditionally this uh, cost of google has gone up over time um, you really need to be um, thinking about uh, how you can convert that traffic. I think, not saying it's bad at the moment, but if you look at overall conversion rates, um, if we take all channels, um, so we're talking outbound, uh, direct traffic, everything, the average conversion rate across that is like 3%. So you think about global ad spend and what we're spending online, and we're saying 97% of people don't do what you want. They don't go on to buy or they don't go on to purchase. Now, clearly, it's going to be 100%. Um, but to think that that's okay is is almost mind boggling. Like how much waste is that? Um, so trying to trying to change the mindset of brands to say right instead of let's just spend more money or or let's optimize our ads. I mean for years people have optimized their ads and they've changed the wording. And on Facebook they've changed the messaging. We're going to try a picture of this. We're going to try slightly different text. You know massive data teams that all they do is optimize creatives online. And then most brands take them to the same page and then wonder why performance isn't quite what they expect it to be. Um, so our approach is taking um, that logic um, to optimization. So what you would do before the click and doing it post click. Um, and that you, you need to you need to be doing that, you need to be tracking it, you need to be understanding it. You know, if someone says to me, what's your conversion rate? They'll probably at the moment say our conversion rate for direct is this and our conversion rate for organic is this. Um, but if I say well, what's your conversion rate for a Peak customers who have bought before. Well, I'm not, not really sure. What about your VIP customers? What's their conversion rate? Mm, I'm not sure. How many people have come back, go on to buy again? Not sure. Some brands are starting to look at that, but it's these kind of nudge these segments where you can nudge them further, where you can really push on your performance of your brand. If someone's bought before and you've got, um, so if it's like they bought a toothbrush, for example, which first thing that came to my head. And you sell <laughs> accessories for a toothbrush. I don't. I literally don't know why I came up with toothbrush. We'll go with it. <laughs> I know it's such we'll, a great analogy. I'm, I'm looking forward to where this goes. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with toothbrush. But if you if you buy a toothbrush, um, uh, an electric one, I must say, um, and you sell a dock and you sell um, kind of uh, additional tips for the toothbrush, for example, and you know someone's bought that before, and you have data on that. When they come back, maybe don't try to sell them the same toothbrush again, and try sell them those accessories. And just doing stuff like that, you know, will have a massive, um, you know, that's just one example, but um, a massive impact on on um, on your conversion. Um, it's quite interesting as well. We look at um, e-commerce brands. We look at signals on what people are doing online. A really interesting one that we we've uh, picked up on 
is people going to the um, delivery information and figuring out how much is delivery and when do I get it. That is like a really big buying signal that most brands won't see. So it's like if you've got something in your basket and then they go to the delivery page to check about the information, that intent is like probably they want it and maybe they want free delivery if they, if they look like they're going to leave or maybe they really care about it arriving soon. So let's deliver something, some personalized messaging somewhere to nudge them through the conversion based on that signal. Um, and by doing that, you can obviously um, uh, influence their, their journey and ultimately deliver higher ROI because more people go on to buy. Yeah, I tell you what, I wish there was, well, there, there could have been, I just didn't look hard enough, but years ago, because I think I, I started my journey into marketing a bit without going too much into detail in the backstory, essentially marketing uh, a marketing assistant for a... Um, a very te- uh, sort of global tech company. It's a small company, but a global tech company. But we targeted so many different market verticals, but we were targeting all of those market verticals with the same messaging. And I was sort of there thinking, like, we we have to go to different industry specific events in order to segment our audience, in order to segment the marketing. So we never went to this to the same event with the same type of banner and the same messaging. We always customize the messaging depending on the industry and the event. And I was always like, right, how do we do this online? Because we have all of this traffic coming to the website, but yeah. we have no way of kind of identifying what somebody's looking for and what industry that they're working in. Because the messaging, you know, like I used to work in the mining industry and then you wouldn't target somebody in the mining industry with the same messaging that you would do somebody working in architecture, for example. But yeah. we were trying really hard to do this. And as a result, we had a really high bounce rate. And as a result that, you know, we did, we knew that we were turning so many people away because it wasn't personalized enough. And it was very, yeah. it, it had to be generic because it had to capture the attention of a wide audience, which was actually doing us more harm than good. Uh, and now I'm like, oh, I wish I knew now. Sorry, I wish I knew then what I know now because it would have just been so much different. Um, yeah. So how how much effort do brands need to um put into really understanding their their audience before embarking in something like this um it, it depends on on how complex they want to go on the on the on the targeting so we typically for brands would um kind of do what we call like a review basically and we'd look at their conversion black spots so what we would do is come up with um some segments initially we'd agree that with the brand so say we normally ask them you know what's for you what's your main segment so you've got new people coming from here maybe repeat and maybe you've got um, high value purchases. People tend to be emailing. Um, most brands like e-commerce brands tend to be emailing these kind of lists anyway, but then typically not doing it online. Um, so then we'd put those lists in place. We then let them uh, uh, run for normally like 30 days and get some data and pull up um, conversion rate of, the, of each one. And then we work collaborative, collaboratively with the brand to come up with some messaging. Um, Ultimately, um, messaging is key. You can't you can't be relevant if you don't get the message right. Um, it doesn't matter how personalised you know the delivery is and where the message is on the site. It's not the right message. It's not going to work. So we tend to work closely with the brand on that, and then we'll put that into uh, Boostify and run the campaigns um, on each segment. We can split it so we'd have to run it on 100. percent We might try it on five percent of traffic and do a control ten percent. Um, but really. Um, I would say people just need to get started. Um, talking about how much time they need, they need to do. A lot of people think it's a massive job and they don't do it at all. Like, and they're like, oh my God, personalizing the entire site. Like, how are we going to do that? Like, I would say, don't think of it like that. Um, you know, Boostify allows you to essentially just try a couple of segments. Like, people have ideas. Let's just try those. Like, you can get started in, in you know, days really. Um, and then it will grow from there you will start to figure out the different segments and you can put them in and start to learn. Um, but it's just getting started. Most brands just, they think we need to spec out this entire journey of every single customer type and create this big like octopus on the wall and, and they go in and go, oh, how are we going to implement that? That's so difficult. I would just say, just pick kind of high volume, high traffic areas um, or potentially areas that have got low conversion rate um, and focus on just a couple of different campaigns, really simple ones to start with. It's intent for repeat customers that, Instead of saying, don't you know, just something personalized on there that is relevant to them um, and just run those. So, really, don't need to spend loads of time doing it. You can really get started very quickly. And, 
And that is an important message that doesn't just apply to segmenting your audience. Uh, You know, you've heard phrases like progress, not perfection. It doesn't have to be perfect. You've just got to get it going. You know, the power of small, small steps in the right direction. It's so true. Like whatever you want to do, instead of thinking, wow, that's such a huge task, just think like, what, what's the first step that I need to do in order to get that going in order to make that work and start there. Like just make it the simplest thing. Uh, You know, I think I've I've been guilty of that. I think we're all guilty of that. We just sort of overcomplicate things when it doesn't necessarily need to be. And sometimes there are small things that you can do that will make significant differences. So really, really great advice there. Um, Thank you. So I just want to touch a little bit um, because, you know, when, when we were speaking originally, talking about sharing some tips on how to be a good business leader. And, uh, you you know, you were touching on the fact that you're going through a bit of a process at the moment. Um, yep. So do you want to sh- share with the audience, share with our listeners uh, what's going on at the moment and what are your tips? Um, yeah, so um, we were talking earlier, um, me and Charlie, about, um, I would say, I would do I summarise it, um, probably focusing on a startup. Let's, let's put it like that to start with. Um, and understanding at startup phase, so we're not talking about we're talking about startup in the startup phase. Um, understanding just how much work is involved um, in in building a startup, especially when resources are tight. Um, as I touched on, we haven't had investment; we are growing organically, um, and that has its positives, but it's also um, can be quite negative. Um, so you really need to focus on. Um, every part of the of the business. Um, I have the same Charlie that I've also started another business now. Um, well, so essentially I've got two businesses in in a, in a startup phase, um, which in hindsight was probably a terrible idea. Um, I'm just being brutally honest. Um, <laughs> it basically means I've not got time to have a life. I'm I'm kind of working um, eight till ten and weekends all the time. Um, and I think really you have to be doing that anyway. But for one business, if you're genuinely passionate about having a startup, like you genuinely need to be working. Like I'm not, rec- I'm not saying everyone needs no work-life balance, but just understanding um, that a startup is a startup, and if you're not going to put loads of investment into it, and even if you did, like let's say you get VCs involved and you've, and you've got investment, you then can't start another business, or you know, you you you've got people on your shoulder saying you need to be delivering X, Y, and Z. Um, so um, I would just reiterate that um, when running a startup, it kind of has to be your life. You have to live and breathe it. Um, I look at, oh, this is a really bad example, but I look at like Elon Musk, he runs like three companies. Um, and I go like, how does he do that? But he's got a, he's really good at putting a team in place. Um, and he's got the resources. He had a hundred million from selling PayPal or whatever to be able to put that team in place. Now, not all of us have that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have those resources, so I can't put that team in place. Um, so I think at the beginning, when you're small, you really have to completely 100% devote yourself to a startup. Um, otherwise, you can essentially run two businesses um, mediocre, um, um, which is not what I'm doing, I'd like to say. <laughs> but um, it, it definitely makes it harder. Um, so yeah, to anyone who's starting a business, um, a true startup, um, you ultimately need to understand that it, it has to be 100% of your focus day in, day out. Um, you know, we're talking about serial entrepreneurs earlier and running, you know, doing this and doing that. And a lot of people say, well, you need to diversify your income stream. You need one income stream here, like this nine different income streams that you could have, you know, in, your income from rent, income from all these different things. That's great. And I love that. And I want that eventually. Um, but right now, um, I kind of wish. Uh, I could just focus on one thing day in day out instead of two businesses it's definitely harder it's so nice to hear you say that and it's also refreshing to get that that reality of it because there are so many people online at the moment that are all like kind of sort of tagging these get rich quick schemes you know claiming that you know if you start a business that you you know sort of earning sort of six seven figures in a, a very quick time but you touched on the fact the importance of team it takes time to establish those teams. But once you've established those teams, once you've got those resources behind you, then it makes things easier to then grow and to scale. But before you get there, you need those foundations in place and you need to focus on on building those foundations. So really interesting point there. And um, yeah, don't don't try to go it solo because if you go it solo, then you're very much on your own. And like you said, you know, you, you know, it has to be life and it does take over. 
yeah, um, totally. Um, and with with Boostify, sorry to interrupt. Um, we ended up partnering with a, with an agency uh, in Leeds um, called Nerve. Um, so that was that was how I alleviated. So so there's an agency in Leeds who were um, selling uh, Boostify to their clients and doing a really good job of it. Um, so I kind of went to them and said, uh, you, know, you, you guys are selling it really well. You understand the product. I'd worked with the MD, um, Michael Ward, previously. Um, he also worked for Age Partnership at one point. Um, and I said to him, you know, you're really good at doing this. Do you want to get involved in Boostify? Um, so he's now uh, coming as our COO. Um, so he helps support that. Now, I could have never put a COO in when I started, um, but the journey has allowed us to do that and to, and to strike up that, that, that relationship. But it took time. Um, so you can, it's all about timing, I think, as well. Yeah. Like if I'd started two businesses on the same day, it would have ultimately ended in probably madness. Um, but if, if you kind of have a plan in place and you know you, you have that support network, it's definitely possible to um, grow something. You just need to you just need a plan. Like you just can't do everything. If it's just you at the beginning or a development team or you're kind of doing everything, we touched on it. As someone who starts a startup, you have to be good at everything. You have to be good at accounts. You have to be good at managing people. You have to be good at my in my business I had to be good at coding I had to be good at then you've got data security and you need to understand that and then looking at insights and kind of machine learning and all these different things that start to pop up as you grow a business um, you have to be good at all those things um, so you definitely need to um, at least attempt to put the support networks in place obviously growing a team if you can afford to do it or you know coming up with more creative ideas such as partnering with an agency for example Oh, I love that. I love that. Lots of great advice here. Uh, you know, sort of using your network so people you already know, understanding who can help you get to where you want to go, and partnering up with people that will help you achieve your goals. Because you know, those partnerships and those collaborations will help you get to where you want to go so much faster. So, yes. really, really great advice there. Uh, I realise that we're we've kind of been talking for quite a while now. So, just yep. to wrap things up, a uh, couple of questions for you. So. You know, are there any uh, books, courses, resources, or anything like that that have really helped you um, get to where where you are now? Uh, anything that you want to recommend that our listeners would also benefit from? Yeah, um, I actually went on a on a three day course um, run by Dale Carnegie, the How to Win Friends and Influence People. Everybody will have heard of the book. There yeah. is actually a course. Um, it was three days. It was it was in Leeds, um, but I think they run around the country. That worked really well for me. Um, it was just about, um, just as the book, about, you know, understanding people, understanding what everyone's wants are, mm-hmm. using people's names as much as possible, um, and all the, all the, you know, I wish, I, you know, I should know it all, I was on the three-day course, but kind of um, just understanding people, you know, when you, you know, and it applies to everything, you know, when you're in a sales pitch, you know, you're, you're, you want to um, understand their frustrations um, so that you can solve them. Um, you know, nobody buys something where they have a problem. You know, you're selling something you don't need. So sell them a pen. Well, I don't need a pen. Um, so I'm not going to buy it. Um, so I did a three day course on that, and that that was really instrumental. I felt like um, my business um, relationships um, and kind of uh, the work I was doing with my team really pushed on. Spent more time with my team, more time listening to to what their wants were. Like, did I know what every single one of my team wanted? No, I knew what I wanted more sales, growth, more clients, client wins, success. Like, but what did each individual person want? Um, and learning um, uh, that course really helped me to to unlock that. Um, so I would really recommend that course. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think of anything else. I don't really read books, if I'm honest. Um, but I I do use an app called Blinkist. You might have heard of it. Oh, um, I love that app. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I use Blinkist. It's like books in like fifteen minutes. Yeah. Um, as like an audio book. Um, I love that. Um, Husband Friends is on there. A couple of other books, Eat the Frog. Um, about doing the the biggest, most important task first. Um, I love stuff like that. I'm quite I'm quite an organisation freak. Like I have a to do list that I, that I run, and I categorise everything each day, depending on if it's uh, high impact as I call it yeah um, that really works for me I always try and try to do a high impact task a day which for me is something that will directly go to benefiting my overall goals which is for both businesses is, is to grow revenue ultimately and help more clients um, yeah so yeah that's probably what I'd say 
brilliant like Blinkist is fantastic I had that for quite a while um and that and obviously Audible like I'm a big audio um yeah. like podcasts and audio books I love it um there is another resource which you may benefit from or anybody else called read uh, read in graphics um oh, I heard of that I'm like a raving geek, <laughs> um, a big graphic novel fan. So uh, this basically is like Blinkist. So you get the audio, and so you get like a little book summary, but you also get um, the entire book written in a uh, an infographic. So oh, they sort of summarize the book in an infographic. It's like an annual subscription. It's not it's not one of the cheapest things, but if you're very visual, um, it, it kind of covers all bases. So yeah, read in graphics uh, is, is fantastic as yeah, well as Blinkist because really that's an app and you can just use it on the go. So it's great. Yeah. 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 Um, that's interesting. Like that. Well, any parting words of wisdom that you want to leave us with? Um, uh, I, I would refer to my post on my wall, um, which you can't actually see. I was going to um, say. <laughs> but but it, um, it's by Anthony Burrill. And it says work hard and be nice to people. And I literally live my life by that. So I would say in everything you do, work hard, focus on, on your business. And ultimately, in every every time you meet someone, if it's a client, if it's your team, just be nice. And and I truly believe that if you if you do both those things, you will go on and be successful. Um, and I live I live by that. So um, yeah, that would be my parting words. Stolen from someone else. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I always use like, just be kind. You know, it doesn't take any energy to smile to a stranger or just be kind to somebody at all. So exactly. brilliant words of wisdom. You don't really know what, what is going on in other people's uh, other people's worlds. Um, so, you know, treat everyone with respect. Um, and that goes all the way through. I, I genuinely believe you will get more sales. You will, you will grow a bigger team. You will have a more of an impact in the world if you do those things. And, yeah. and just work hard. Like, like there is no shortcut. Um, running your own business like like we were talking about it won't just happen you've got to really go out there and put the effort in um that kind of there's a i, I read a, a book actually on um well i say i read a book i, I saw it on linkers about the two percent increase a day so it's about this kind of um if you just perform two percent better every day um the cumulative effect will mean you'll go on and do great things and um, so kind of always just try to just try to be a little bit better every single day even if it's just by a little bit and, and yeah that'll really help you yeah and I like I always um my leadership style very much taken from all of my kind of sporting heroes and that was always um Dave Brailsford who uh heads up British Cycling and Team Sky and it's all about yeah the power you know power of small incremental changes that will make the biggest yeah. difference and for anybody else interested there is another podcast episode um with Paul Dunn so his mantra is all about the power of small so making small changes that create big impacts so for anybody listening to that and likes that concept of making small more changes go and listen to the uh, episode with Paul Dunn because you'll get a lot of value from that but thank you so much for uh, speaking with me because I know that you said that this is your first podcast interview yes, ever yes so you know I okay. hope that you find other podcasts to be featured on because it's been an absolute pleasure and I really thanks do wish on. you all the success in the world so thank you amazing thanks for having me Appreciate Brilliant. It. Before we go, just quickly, I realise most important question for anybody listening that wants to find out more about Boostify, that wants to connect with you, what's the best way that they can do that? Uh, yeah, just head over to boostify.co.uk. Uh, um, that's the easiest way uh, and get in touch. Brilliant. Um, okay, well, I will include uh, the links in the show notes on the website, which is charliewyman.com forward slash podcast. So in the meantime, thank you so much, Jonathan. And for everybody else, have a wonderful day. Thanks. Ciao for now.